the eighth appendix of the Holy Quran, translation of Abdullah Yusuf Ali, is First Contact of Islam with World Movements, the Contemporary Roman and Persian Empires, see Surah 30, Ayat 2 through 7. The conflict between the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius and the Persian king Khosrow Parwis Khosrows II is referred to in Surah 30. It will therefore be convenient now to review very briefly the relations of these two great empires and the way in which it gradually decayed before the rising sun of Islam. The story has not only a political significance, but a deep spiritual significance in world history. If we take the Byzantine Empire as a continuation of the empire that grew out of the Roman Republic, first conflict took place in BCE 53, when the consul Crassus, famous for his riches, was defeated in his fight with the Parthians. If we go back further to the time of the Greek city-states, we can refer back to the invasion of Greece by Xerxes in BCE 480 to 479, and the effective repulse of that nation, uh, of that invasion by sea and land, by the united cooperation of the Greek states. The Persian Empire in those days extended to the western Mediterranean coast of Asia Minor, but as it included the Greek cities of Asia Minor, there was constant intercourse and war and peace between Persia and the Hellenic Greek world. The cities in Greece proper had their own rivalries and jealousies, and Greek cities or parties often invoked the aid of the great king, Shah Hinshah of Persia, against their opponents. By the peace of Antal Sidas of BCE 387, Persia became practically the Suzerian power of Greece. This was under the Achaemenian dynasty of Persia. Then came the rise of Macedonia and Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire. In BCE 330, this spread the Hellenic influence as far east as Central Asia and as far south as Syria, including Palestine, Egypt, and Northern Africa generally. Rome and its expansion westwards reached the Atlantic and in its expansion eastwards absorbed the territories of Alexander's successors and became the mistress of all countries with a Mediterranean sea coast. The nations of the Roman Empire insensibly melted away the Roman named people, given chapter two. I only have the abbreviated, but I read the other. Meanwhile, there were native forces in Persia which asserted themselves and established in 10 of the Common Era, the dynasty of the Arsakids, Ashkanian. This was mainly the outcome of a revolt against Hellenism and its spear point was in Parthia. The Arsakids won back Persia proper and established the Western boundary of Persia and a line drawn roughly from the eastern end of the Black Sea southward to the Euphrates at a point northeast of Palmyra. This would include the region of the Caucasus, excluding the Black Sea coast and Armenia and Lower Mesopotamia and the Persian Empire. This was the normal boundary between Persia and the Roman Empire until the Islamic Empire wiped out the old monarchy of Persia and a great part of the Byzantine Empire and annexed Egypt. Palestine, Syria, and gradually Asia Minor, and finally extinguishing the whole of the Byzantine Empire. 
Another stage in Persian history was reached when the Arsacans were overthrown and the, Sass and the Sassanians came into power under Archer the first. In 225 of the Common Era, the, Sassas, uh, the Sassanian Empire was in a sense a continuation of the Achaemenian Empire and was a reaction against the corruptions of the Zoroastrian religion, which had crept under the Parthian dynasty of the Arsacids, but the religious reforms were only partial. There was some interaction between Christianity and the Zoroastrian religion. For example, the great mystic Mani, who was a painter as well as religious leader, founded the sect of Manichaeism. He flourished in the reign of Shapur I, 241 to 272 of the Common Era, and seems to have preached a form of Gnostic faith in which Alexandrian philosophy was mixed with Christian doctrine and the old Persian belief in the dual principle of good and evil, the Sassanians failed to purify religion and only adhered to fire worship in arrogance, luxury, sensuality, and monopoly, power, and privilege, which it is the office of religion to denounce and root out. That office was performed by Islam. When the seat of the Roman Empire was transferred to Constantinople, Byzantium, in the time of Constantine, 330 of the Common Era, the conflict between Rome and Persia became more and more frequent. The true peninsula of Arabia was never conquered either by Rome or by Persia, although its outlying parts were absorbed in either the one or the other at various times. It is interesting to notice that the Roman Emperor Philip, 244 to 249 of the Common Era, was a born Arab and that the architecture of the Abataans in the city of Petra and al, -Hidra, uh, and al show a mixture of Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and indigenous Arab cultures. Arabia received the cultural influences of Persia and the Byzantine Empire, but was a silent spectator other conflicts until Islam was brought into the main currents of world politics. The Yemen coast of Arabia, which was easily accessible by sea to Persia, was the battleground between the Persian Empire and the Abyssinian Empire just across the Red Sea. Abyssinia and Arabia had cultural and political relations for many centuries. Amharic, the ruling language of Abyssinia is closely allied with Arabic and Amharic people went on, uh, went as colonists and conquerors from Arabia through Yemen. Shortly before the birth of the Holy Prophet, Abyssinia had been an occupation of Yemen for some time having displaced a Jewish dynasty. The Abyssinians professed the Christian religion, and although their church was doctrinally separate from the Byzantian church, there was a great deal of sympathy between the Byzantines and the Abyssinians on account of their common Christian religion. One of the Abyssinian viceroys in Yemen was Abraha, who convinced the design of destroying the temple at Mecca. He led an expedition in which elephants formed a conspicuous feature to invade Mecca and destroy the Kaaba. He met a disastrous repulse, which is referred to in the Quran in Surah 105. This event was in the year of the Prophet's birth and marks the beginning of the great conflict which enabled Arabia eventually to obtain a leading place among the nations of the world. The year usually given for the Prophet's birth is 570, the Common Era, though the date must be taken as only approximate being the middle figure between 569 and 571, the extreme possible limits. Abyssinians having been overthrown, the Persians were established in Yemen and their power lasted there until about the seventh year of the 
Hetra. So approximately 628 of the common era when Yemen accepted Islam. And so his birth year is say something that strips off fanaticism and removes of its possibility is you know the birth and the death just it's not an important detail it's i mean it's one of the least important details so maybe that's maybe we don't pass that on you know half the people weren't passing that information on um that could have The outstanding event in Byzantine history in the sixth century was the reign of Justinian. 527 to 565 of the common era. And in Persian history, the reign of Anau Shirwan, 531 to 579 of the common era. Justinian is well known for his great victories in Africa and for the great digest he made a Roman law and jurisprudence. In spite of the scandalous life of his queen Theodora, he occupies an honorable place in the history of the Roman Empire. Anaushirwan is known in Persian history as the just king. They were contemporary rulers for a period of 34 years. In their time, the Roman and Persian empires were in close contact between uh, during peace and war. Anau Shirwan dismissed being adopted by the Roman emperor. If the adoption had come off, he would have become one of the claimants to the Byzantine, to the Byzantine throne. He invaded Syria and destroyed the important Christian city of Antioch in 540 to 541. It was only the able defense of Belisarius the Roman general, which saved the Roman Empire from further disasters in the east. On the other hand, the Tyrannian Avars, driven in front of the Turks, had begun the invasion of Constantinople from the western side. Justinian made an alliance with the Abyssinians as a Christian nation, and the Abyssinians and the Persians came in conflict in Yemen. Thus, world conditions were hemming in Arabia on all sides. It was Islam that not only saved Arabia, but enabled it to expand and to play a prominent part in world history after the annihilation of the Persian Empire and the partial destruction of the Byzantine Empire. The sixth century of the Common Era and the first half of the seventh century were indeed a marvelous period in the world's history. Great events and transformations were taking place throughout the then known world. We have referred to the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, which dominated the civilized portions of Europe, Africa, and Western Asia. The only two other countries of note in history in those days were India and China. In India, there was the glorious period of Harsha Vardhana, 606 to 647 of the Common Era, in which art, science, and literature flourished. Political power was on a healthy basis, and religious inquiry was bringing India and China into closer relationship. The famous Chinese Buddhist traveler, Yuang Chuang, or Yuang Song, or Suang Tsang, performed his famous, uh, his pious pilgrimage to India in 629 to 645, um, it's about the squeaking of the furniture, uh, in India, the glorious Dang dynasty was established in 618. The Chinese art of that dynasty led the world in political power. China extended from the Pacific in the east to the Persian Gulf in the west. There was unity and peace in China, hitherto more or less isolated, received ambassadors from Persia, Constantinople, Magadha and Nepal in 643, but all this pomp and glitter had in it the seeds of decay. Persia and Byzantium collapsed in the next generation. 
India was in chaos after Harsha's death. The Chinese emperor, uh, the Chinese empire, could not remain free from the barbarians. The Great Wall, begun in the third century BCE, was soon to be out of date. About uh, by about 683, the Khitans from the northwest and the Tibetans from the south were molesting China. The Germans and Goths and the Vandals were pressing further and further into the Roman Empire. From Asia, the Avars and the Turks were pressing both on the Romans and the Persians, and sometimes playing off the one against the other, the simpler and less sophisticated nations with their ruler, but more genuine virtues were gaining ground into all that welter came the message of Islam to show up as by galvanic action, the false from the truth, the empty from the eternal, the decrepit, uh, the decrepit, and the corrupt from the vigorous and pure. The ground of history was being prepared for the new birth in religion. Anau Shirawan was succeeded on the Persian throne by an unworthy son, Hormuz. 579 to 590. Kind of like the thing about Solomon and Rehoboam, right? Um, had it not been for the talents of his able general, Mahram, his empire would have been ruined by the invasion of the Turks on one side and the Romans on the other. Eventually, Bahram rebelled, uh, rebelled, and Hermuz was deposed and killed. His son, Kusrau Parwiz, Kosaros II, took refuge with the Byzantine emperor Maurice, practically adopted him as a son, and restored him to the Persian throne with Roman arms. Kusrau reigned over Persia from 590 to 628 of the Common Era. It was up to him. Uh, it was to him that the Holy Prophet addressed one of his letters, inviting him to Islam towards the end of his life. It is not certain whether the letter the letter was actually delivered to him or to his successor, as it is not easy to calculate precisely synchronous dates of the Christian era with those of the earliest years of the Hijra era. In Arabic, in Arabic and Persian records, in Arabic and Persian records, the term Kisra refers usually to Kusrau, Parwiz, Kosaros II, and sometimes to Kusrau and now Shirwan, Kosaros I. While the term Kusrau is usually treated as generic, as the title of the kings of Persia generally, but this by no means was always the case. Kisra is an Arabic form of Kusrau, the name of Anaushiran, uh, uh, Anaushirwan has been shortened from the time of Firdausi onwards to Nushirwan. The Pehlavi form is Anashek Ruwan of immortal soul. The Roman Emperor Maurice, 582 to 602, had a mutiny in his army, and his capital revolted against him. The army chose a simple centurion called Phocas as emperor and executed Maurice himself. The usurper Phocas ruled from 602 to 610, but his tyranny soon disgusted the empire. Heraclius, the governor, Exarch of a distant province, Africa, raised the standard of rebellion, and his young son, called Heraclius, was sent to Constantinople to depose Phocas and assume the reins of power. It was this younger Heraclius who ascended the throne of Constantinople in 610 and ruled till 642 who figures in Muslim history as Hirakul. Kusrau Parwiz called himself the son of the emperor 
Maurice. During his refuge at Constantinople, he had married a Byzantine wife in Nazami's romance. She is known as Mariam. According to some historians, she was the daughter of the Emperor Maurice, but Gibbon throws doubt on that relationship. In any case, he used the resources of the Persian Empire to fight the usurper Phocas. He invaded the Byzantine Empire in 603. The war between the Persians and the Romans became a national war and continued after the fall of Phocas in 610, the Common Era. The Persians had sweeping victories and conquered Aleppo, Antioch, and the chief Syrian cities, including Damascus in 611. Jerusalem fell to their arms in 614 to 615, just eight to seven years before the sacred Hitra. The city was burnt and pillaged. The Christians were massacred. The churches were burnt. The burial place of Christ was itself insulted, and many relics, including the true cross, on which the Christians believed that Christ had been crucified, were carried away to Persia. The priests of the Persian religion celebrated an exultant triumph over the priests of Christ. In this pillage and massacre, the Persians were assisted by crowds of Jews who were discontented with the Christian domination. And the Arabs, to whom any opportunity of plunder and destruction was itself welcomed, it is probably this striking event the victory of the Persians over the Roman Empire, which is referred to in Surah 30, al rum of the Quran. The Arabs naturally sided with the Persians and their destructive zeal and thought that the destruction of the Christian power of Rome would also mean a setback to the message of the prophet, the true successor of Jesus. For our holy prophet had already begun his mission and the promulgation of Allah's religion in 610 of the Common Era. While the whole world believed that the Roman Empire was being killed by Persia, it was revealed to him that the Persian victory was short-lived and that within a period of a few years, the Romans would conquer again and deal a deadly blow to the Persians. The Arabs who were then persecuting the Holy Prophet in Mecca hoped that the persecution would destroy the Holy Prophet's new religion. In fact, both their persecution and the deadly blows aimed by the Persians and the Romans at each other were instruments at Allah's hands for producing those conditions which made Islam thrive and increase until it became the predominant power in the world. The Persians The Persian flood of conquest did not stop the conquest of Jerusalem. It went on to Egypt, which was also conquered and annexed to the Persian Empire in 616. The Persian occupation reached as far as Tripoli in North Africa. At the same time, another Persian army ravaged Asia Minor and reached right up to the gates of Constantinople. Not only the Jews and Arabs, but the various Christian sects, which had been persecuted as heretics by the Romans, joined in the fray and helped the Persians. The condition of Heraclius became indeed pitiable. With all these calamities, he had to deal with the Abars, who were attacking from the other side of Constantinople, which was practically in a state of siege, famine and pestilence added to the horrors of the situation. In these desperate circumstances, Heraclius conceived a brilliant plan. He knew that the Persians were weak in sea power. He used his sea power to attack them in the rear in 622, the year of the Hitra. He transported his army by sea through the Aegean Sea to the bay just south of the Taurus Mountains. He fought a decisive battle with the Persians at Isis in the same plain in which Alexander the Great had defeated the Persians of his day in his famous march to Syria and Egypt. The Persians were taken by surprise and routed, but they had still a large 
force in Asia Minor, which they could have brought into play against the Romans if Heraclius had not made another and equally unexpected dash by sea from the north. He returned to Constantinople by sea, made a treaty with the Avars, and with their help, kept the Persians at bay around the capital. Then he led three campaigns in 623, 624, and 625 of the Common Era along the southern shore of the Black Sea and took the Persians again in the rear in the region made round Trepizond and Kars. Through Armenia, he penetrated into Persia and got into Mesopotamia. He was now in a position to strike at the very heart of the Persian Empire. A decisive battle was fought on the Tigris near the city of Mosul in December 627 of the Common Era. Before this battle, however, he had taken care to get the alliance of the Turks and with their help to relieve Constantinople in 626 against the Persians and the treacherous Avars, who would then join the Persians. Heraclius celebrated his triumph in Constantinople in March 628. Peace was then made between the two empires on the basis of the status quo ante. Heraclius, in pursuance of a vow he had made, went south in the autumn to Emesa, Hymnus, Hymnus, and from there marched on foot to Jerusalem to celebrate his victories and to restore to its place the Holy Cross, which had been carried away by the Persians and was returned to the emperor as a condition of peace. Heraclius's route was strewn with costly carpets, and he thought that the final deliverance had come for his people and his empire. Either on the way or in Jerusalem, he met a messenger from the Holy Prophet carrying a letter inviting him to the truth faith as renewed in the living messenger of the age. He apparently received the message with courtesy, but he did not realize the full import of the new world, which was being shaped according to Allah's plans. And the future that was opening through the new revelation Perhaps in his heart, he felt impressed by the story which he'd heard from the Arabs about the Holy Prophet, but the apparent grandeur of his empire and the pride of his people prevented him from openly accepting the renewed message of Allah. He caused a search to be made for any Arab who was sufficiently acquainted with the Holy Prophet to tell him something about him. Abu Sufyan was then trading in a caravan in Syria. He was a cousin of the Prophet and belonged to the Umayya branch of the family. He was sent for to Jerusalem, Alia Capitolina. When Abu Sufyan was called to the presence of Heraclius, the emperor questioned him closely about this new prophet. Abu Sufyan himself was at that time outside Islam and really an enemy of the prophet and his message. Yet the story he told of the truth and sincerity of the holy prophet, of the way in which the poor and the lowly flocked to him, of the wonderful increase of his power and spiritual influence, and the way in which people who had once received the light never got disillusioned, or went back to their life of ignorance, and of all the integrity with which he kept his covenants, made a favorable impression on the minds of Heraclius. That story is told in dramatic detail by al-Bukhari and other Arabian writers. Wasn't Bukhari not Arabian? I mean, wrote in Arabic, but I don't think Bukhari was Arabian. Uzbeki or something like that. Um, but even if someone's your enemy, don't don't lie about them. You know. The relations of the Persian monarch with Islam were different. He either Kusrau. Parwis, our successor, received the Holy Prophet's messenger with contumely and tore up his letter. So will his kingdom be torn up, said the Holy Prophet. When the news reached him, the Persian monarch ordered 
his governor in Yemen to go and arrest the man who had so far forgotten himself as to address the grandson of Anau Shirwan on equal terms. When the Persian governor tried to carry out his monarch's command, the result was quite different from what the great Persian king of kings had expected. His agent accepted the truth of Islam and Yemen was lost as province of the Persian empire and became a, a portion of the new Muslim state. Kusrao Parwiz died in February of 628 of the common era. He had been deposed and imprisoned by his own cruel and undutiful son who reigned only for a year and a half. There were nine candidates from the Persian throne in the remaining four years. Anarchy reigned supreme in the Sassanian Empire until the dynasty was extinguished by the Muslim victory at the Battle of Ada'in in 637. The great and glorious Persian monarchy, full of pride and ambition, came to an anonymous end and a new chapter opened for Persia. Under the banner of Islam, the Roman Empire itself began to shrink gradually and losing its territory, not to Persia, but to the new Muslim power which absorbed both the ancient empires. The power arose in its vigor to proclaim a new and purified creed to the whole world. Already in the last seven years of Heraclius' reign, 635 to 642 of the Common Era, several of the provinces nearest to Arabia had been annexed to the Muslim Empire. The Muslim Empire continued to spread on in Asia Minor, to the north and Egypt to the south, the Eastern Roman Empire became a mere shadow with a small bit of territory round its capital. Constantinople eventually surrendered to the Muslim in 1453. That was the real end of the Roman Empire. But in the wonderful century in which the prophet lived, another momentous revolution was taking place. The Roman pontificate of Gregory the Great, 590 to 604 of the Common Era, was creating a new Christianity as the old Christianity to the East was slowly dying out. The Patriarch of Constantinople had claimed to be the universal bishop with the jurisdiction over all the other bishops of Christendom. This had been silently but gradually questioned by the popes of Rome. They had been building up a liturgy, a church organization, and a body of discipline for the clergy, different from those of the Holy Orthodox Church. They had been extending their spiritual authority in the barbarian provinces of Gaul and Spain. They had been amassing estates and endowments. They had been accumulating secular authority in their own hands. Pope Gregory the Great converted the Anglo-Saxon invaders of Great Britain to his form of Christianity. He promised, he protected Italy the, from the ravages of the Franks and Lombards and raised the Sea of Rome to the position of power, which exercised ample jurisdiction over the Western world. He was preparing the way for the time when one of his successors would crown under his authority, the Frankish Charlemagne as Emperor of Rome and of the West in 800 of the Common Era, and another of his successors would finally break away from the Orthodox Church of Constantinople in 1054 by the Pope's excommunication of the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Greeks. And there was a complex of seven cities that was called by the Arabs the name of Mada'in, the cities, the Takt e Kisra, the Ark of Ketisfan, still stands in a ruinous condition on this site. There seems to have been the chief capital of the Sassassians at the Arab conquest, which may be dated either from the Battle of Qadassia or that of Mada'in both fought in 637 of the Common Era, after which Persia, which then included Iraq, came into the Muslim Empire. The Abbasi Empire built Baghdad for its capital under, under Mansur in, 600, uh, I mean in 762 of the Common Era. When that empire was broken up, 
and 1258 of the Common Era. There was for some confusion for two centuries in the National Persian Empire, the Safawi, 1499 to 1736 of the Common Era arose and Shah Selim established his capital in the Northwest corner in Tabriz. Shah Abbas the Great of 1587 to 1628 of the Common Era had his capital at the more central city of Isfahan or Isfahan after the Safawi dynasty. Confusion reigned again for about four decades when the Afghans were in the ascendant. When the Qajar or Qajar dynasty of 1795 to 1925 of the Common Era was firmly established under the Aga Muhammad Khan. Tehran, Tehran near the Caspian, where his family originated, became the capital, and it still remains the capital under modern-day Iran. A note on the Persian capitals may be interesting so long as the Persian, as Persia, was under the influence of the Semitic Elamites. The chief residence of the rulers was at Susa, near the modern Dizful, about, 80, uh, about 50 miles northeast of Shustar, in the Medic or Median period, say, BCE 700 to 550. The capital was, as we should expect, in the highlands of Media, in Ekpatana, the site of the modern city of Hamadan, 180 miles west of modern Tehran. Ekpatana remained, even in Sassassian times, the summer capital of Persia, with the Achaemenians, uh, BCE 550 to 330, we come to a period of full national and imperial life. Susa was the chief Achaemenian capital from the time of Darius the First onwards, though Persepolis, Estapar, in the mountain region near modern Shiraz and about 40 miles northeast of Shiraz was used as the capital, uh, as the city of royal burial. Alexander himself as a ruler in Persia died in Babylon. Later when the center of gravity moved north and northeast, other sites were selected. The Arsakids, Ashkanian, or Parthians were a tribal power, fitly called in Arabic, Muluk al Tawaif, and had probably no fixed or centralized capital. The Sassassian took over a site where there were a number of cities, among which were Ketesapon and Seleucia on opposite banks of the river Tigris. This site is about 45 miles north of the old site of Babylon and 25 below the latter city of Baghdad. Ketesapon and Seleucia were Greek cities founded by one of Alexander's successors, Seleucia being named after Seleucus. And as far as references among Western writers, the chief authority is Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, mainly chapters 40 to 42 and 45 to 46. I've given reference to other chapters in the body of this appendix. His delineation of the characters of Heraclius and Khosros II is brief but masterly. L. Drapeyron's French monograph, Le Empereur Heraclius, uh, Paris, 1869, throws further light on an interesting personality. A.J. Butler's Arab Conquest of Egypt, Oxford, 1902, gives a good account of Heraclius, the famous French dramaticist Corneille has left a play of Heraclius, but it turns more on an intricate and imaginary plot in the early life of Heraclius 
and on the character of Heraclius as emperor. And mother of the undutiful son who killed Kusrao and seized his throne, among the other Eastern writers, we find a detailed description of the interview of Abu Sufyan and Bukhari's Sahih, a book on the beginning of inspiration, the notes, and the excellent English translation of Muhammad Assad, they pulled Weiss are helpful. Tabari's history, as usual, is valuable. Mir Khan's Khawin Shah Raudat Al Safa, translated by Rahat Sek, will give an English readers a summary, uh, secondhand, of the various Arabic authorities. Maulana Shibli's otherwise excellent Sirat Al Nabi is in this respect disappointing. Maulana Zafar Ali's Galaba Erun is an Urdu source from Lahore in 1926. And Yusuf Ali considered it important in terms of its um, notes. And sometimes the note section is the reason for getting a book. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.